The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Today we're going to be taking a look at a classic movie, the start of a franchise about a dog who saves a boy from a well of despair. That's right, we're going to be talking about Air Bud. What the fuck? Um, Hey everyone, welcome back to What the Film. This is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And we're going to talk about Air Bud here in a moment, and a surprising film for me. I think the plot synopsis for this can be summed up very, very briefly. Interrupt me, Marisha, if you feel I'm missing something here. A, a sad boy moves to a new town, doesn't mm -hmm. have many friends. This boy likes basketball, he finds a stray dog, he plays basketball sometimes with the dog. Right. That pretty much sum up. I mean, there that's that's the plot. There's there's more that we'll go into, obviously, but that, that sums it up pretty well, don't you that's, think? That's that's essentially it, yeah. So now that we've got the basic plot out of the way, that took twelve seconds for this film. Mm -hmm. Let's go into our what the fuck moments. Marisha, why don't you start us out? Wanton clown destruction. A dog getting his tooth brushed. I know that's a thing, but what kid thinks of that as a way to impress his parent with the dog? I like the coach's motto to teach his basketball team, which was, if you can win on the court, you can win at life, which is the exact opposite. I was taken by the music throughout the film. I thought it went everywhere from Peter and the Wolf to we've won the war, now the boys are home. I thought the coach's nervous breakdown about that kid Tom dropping the ball so often and hurling basketballs at him over and over and over again, that, that got a little what the fuck for me. Definitely. And, you know, so those I think are the good moments to start with. And, and with that scene, which is literally a scene with like a 45-year-old man throwing basketballs at a child until he bleeds. Yeah. My favorite part about that scene was how Buddy, the dog, is drawn to misery. There's absolutely no reason for the dog to be, like, drawn upstairs and into this darkened court where this is happening, yet the dog is like, A child being beaten somewhere. I must attend to it. You know, that sounds about right, too, because he even follows the kid in the first place to this old abandoned basketball court and just becomes uh, addicted to pudding or whatever. And not only does he follow him, but he he eats this vanilla pudding that's been left out. That's what it was, right? Vanilla pudding? Yeah, yeah. It was never made exactly clear, I assume, because they wanted to stay clear of uh, rights issues or whatever. But he, he puts out this vanilla pudding and there's this rustling in the bush. I thought it was interesting how throughout at least the first half of the film, Buddy is kind of portrayed as a serial killer. <laughs> He, he was always hiding in bushes, and then later you see him creeping in the background of a house, and then suddenly he's inside the house. Mm -hmm. I was a little worried where this might go. I mean, the dog's kind of a ninja, like crawling up the trellis, like onto the roof, stealing things from the house. I mean, he's, he's kind of a menace if he weren't so cute. And you know, I, I didn't connect until the final scene why he was burying the newspapers. <laughs> And so I was like, this is an odd film where it's just like, this dog's kind of a dick. I was legitimately worried about the newspaper thing because I imagine myself in that in that situation of the mom. What happens is is he takes the newspaper every single day and bur we don't find out until later that he buries it. But the mom, who is the one who wants to read the newspaper, she's like calling the, the newspaper agency. And then I got worried that that, that was going to be a plot point, like where they were going to like she was going to sue them for not just delivering the newspaper but taking her money it didn't go that far but it easily right. could have right and it's it's um i really thought is buddy gaslighting her like how <laughs> weird like he's it kind of had that feeling where it was like if i just get rid of that tall bitch then we can have fun all our own <laughs> i thought maybe like the third act twist would be that he murders the child not yeah not, but no i guess not right not and not the boy the young girl because there because there are two children well i mean there are a lot of children in the film but then in this family there are two children there's the boy who's i don't know what somewhere between eight and twelve does that sound right yeah that sounds about right and and then he has a younger sister who's uh, a toddler you know and and i thought it was odd that she was even in the movie because there's no real point to that character yeah, that's kind of interesting. Although they do mention, like, early on in the movie, the, they, the reason they don't want to take the dog in is because the mom is worried about the small child, like the dog hurting the small child, and then it just never gets brought up again. Oh, is that? I, I don't even remember that. Yeah, and then the dog is so perfectly safe. Um, 
<laughs> that they're okay with it. It's like, well, Christmas, you know, two weeks passed and it didn't kill the kid yet, so it's probably fine. <laughs> the, you know, I, <laughs> I think if we're talking about this movie in general, we have to talk about the fact that I, it's it's so like we're not gonna say a single word bad about this dog because dear God the circumstances around this dog are so sad. I think the saddest thing about this dog is not the fact that this you know wunderkin dog who was able to do all these tricks with no little little to no visual trickery then died within a year of this movie being made of very painful cancer. I think Aww. the worst thing is the fact that his wiki page has a picture from the sequel and it's like Airbud Wide Retriever was made in in memory of Buddy not pictured. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like the wiki page couldn't even get a picture of the actual dog. They got a picture of the replacement dog. How oh, terrible that is, is that? That is sad. <laughs> to me it was like it was like also just go piss on his grave, why not? <laughs> And and speaking of sad things, the first 30 minutes of this film is bleak as fuck. I mean, it is so, like, upsetting, I think. I think, you know, you were talking about the, the wanton clown destruction, and that scene is so weird. It, I think in general, all of the, like, wacky kids movie stuff in this film feels so out of place. I Yeah, it, it really does, because the, well, just... I don't know, like, I, I thought they would make some attempt to make clowns seem a little bit like, less, I mean, hostile and angry. I, I mean, that was part of the <laughs> plot point, but he was so, I like, at the very beginning, he hated these children and hated his dog, and it was just, it started out bleak that way, and then uh, moved to the main character, and his and, dad and, has and died. Horrifying. The horrifying. Right, right. And his dad has died, and he's depressed, and he, uh, he's the kid is basically the bitch for the basketball team for some reason that we don't really know. He has, and then he has this basketball hero, but then the basketball hero lies about his identity for some reason. <laughs> like he pulls like a, like a what was with that the Darth Vader thing where he's like, oh that guy died a long time ago. And... <laughs> it was, and there was there was there was another Darth Vader moment, and I'm like, I don't even know what to unpack first there. The uh, first of all. The guy who pulls the Darth Vader moment, who lies about his identity, was... Uh, I was amazed this movie had not only a magical animal, but a magical Negro as well. It had both <laughs> of those tropes. And mm -hmm. he's and he's the magical Negro, and he's like, that man died a long time ago. The other Darth Vader moment I thought was, there's there's that scene, it's right before the reveal that Buddy can play basketball, and, and the kid is standing there and he says, I wish my dad were here, he would know what to do. And then it pans down to the dog, and I was like, oh my god, is the dog going to be like, I am your father? Well, I actually made that connection, too, because the kid's only connection to basketball was through his father, and, and he didn't want to play basketball unless with his father gone until the dog came around. Right, right. It, it feels as if there might have been a first draft of this script, which was not a Disney movie, and ended and and poss and probably didn't have like the dog playing basketball and ended with this boy killing himself. I you know that's entirely possible. I mean it it, fe it really feels like that's where we're moving towards. That clown by the way. Did you recognize him? The the actor? No, I don't think so. That's Michael Jeter who is brilliant and essentially plays somewhat close to the same character in the fisher king he he is the sad clown that they rescue from horse shit so he's a clown in another movie too i i believe he's a clown in that movie or at least he's in like some sort of makeup of of you know it's never really clear i i, I don't know it's been a, it's been a while but i just remember him in horse shit and asking for help and it, he's <laughs> he's a very sad character and like here he kind of plays the the flip side of that character like if that's the bi this is the polar or whatever hmm. But yeah, that that opening bit where the you know the you were pointing out before the uh, before the cast the, the 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 banana peel on the couch like nothing added up in all of that destruction. It was just like random shots and then kids screaming and parents being like, "Oh my god!" You know, like yeah, it did seem to jump around quite a bit actually, because because at first too the kids were miserable and then suddenly they brought out the dog and it was all happy fun time and then it was a horror show all of a sudden and so yeah it right it was it was, it was it was like the entire place had like 
grease and vomit on it and so you know and like i mean suddenly we're in like a world war one epic you know like oh god every <laughs> everything is a trap no and and similarly like they have a very uh, uh similar later scene where the dog knock shit over uh and and it ends in this room with with like paint falling everywhere oh and yeah it's like, paint and, and wallpaper glue and right and i noticed that one of the boxes because they essentially seem unpacked at this point one of the boxes had like seven pots that fell out <laughs> it was like why is the box with seven pots in it in this room why does a family of three have a box with seven pots? <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of, I, I, all of the like wacky mayhem scenes seemed as if some somebody was brought in to punch up the script, and they were like, eh, throw in people running around a room. I feel like they kind of had to do that near the end too, because there was a whole bunch of, I mean. The last basketball scene, the big, not the climax of the film, interestingly, but the big basketball game was also kind of that way. Just kind of kids running around bumping into each other until there's a dog and then the dog runs around bumping into each other. And it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I oddly thought that entire scene was really well filmed. I couldn't follow any of the damn like wacky scenes, but I I was completely on top of uh, the basketball scenes. I was like, this this is a basketball movie that wanted to happen, and didn't until the last twenty minutes. And what was weird about that is I was like, you know, I'm watching that scene and I'm like, oh okay, now it's gonna be a basketball movie for a while because at that point, whatever that kid's name is, I I never caught his first name. I know his Josh. last name. Josh. Josh is the main character's name. Yes. Got it. I just remember Fram. Uh, it's like out of the way, Fram. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> but From you know, the he... randomly jerky kids that are jerks for no reason. Right. Yeah. The basketball bullies. I love that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love I love ridiculous bullies in movies. You know, Stephen King I think does bullies so well, and then everybody else just does people who are angry for no apparent reason. Yeah. My, I think my my favorite example of a bully for no reason is James Vanderbeek and Angus, where he gets really concerned that, like, the fat kid might dance really well. And so, like, his whole plot, his, his whole, like, character arc through that is trying to find ways to undercut Angus's possible good dancing skills. I haven't seen it, but that sounds like a great way to bully someone. <laughs> it's... You know, I, I, I love that film, but his character arc is really, his motivations are a little fuzzy. Uh -huh. The thing that I was going to say about that, about that end scene, because, I mean, literally, I mean, as you point out, the climax is something else, but the climax almost feels like a denouement after the 20 minute basketball scene. Right. I mean, there was the whole basketball scene and I figure, I, I thought a movie about a dog that plays basketball you'd want the climax of the film you'd want the point of the film to be the basketball game i mean I, most game or most videos that involve sports are usually that way but instead they make the climax of the film the court scene with characters that we don't even know like the judge and everything and then like the big conflict there was whether the dog was going to choose the abusive angry clown or the nice kid and there was like some actual tension there as if which which basically made the entire rest of the movie not matter at all. Wait, how did it make the rest of the movie not matter? Because I did think that was odd. It was, and it was very upsetting when Buddy started to go toward the clown because that's, it was that's like that's kind of what I mean. Like he, they'd spent the entire movie getting the dog and the kid to be the best friends ever, and then at the very end, it still comes down to he still might choose the angry clown after all. <laughs> right, and it it seemed obvious that. He was moving towards him to take the the newspaper away. That like, oh, buddy is. And how dumb was that as a uh, as a as as a like way to try to get the dog to come back to you? Hey, remember how I abuse you and hit you? You right. want to come back to me, right? Um, but you know, obviously that clown needed some meds. <laughs> I was actually feeling kind of disturbed. Like I don't know, similar to like I I'm trying to think of some horrible movie. Like you know somewhat similar to the, my feelings during the descent when uh buddy was going back to the clown because it was like what a horrible end to the film if it's like none of us can ever escape our cycles of abuse <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah that, i mean so so it does seem that this movie takes like almost seems to take several really dark turns and then right at the last second oh it's okay actually right right so I, I so the point that i keep trying to get back to here is that when that climactic basketball game starts 
I was thinking, oh, okay, this movie's turned into a basketball movie now. We're going to have some, you know, some different basketball scenes. Da, da, da. 15 minutes later, the basketball scene is still going on. And I'm like, are, are these the finals or something? Like, I never, I, I must have missed that. I, well, I remember... it was supposed to be the state final. Like, it was the big game, I, I guess. Well, I think, is, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think somewhere, like, on the news somewhere, it talked about these elementary kids going to state, which I don't think would actually happen on the news. <laughs> but since she didn't get the newspaper, we don't know for sure. I don't know. Right, right, of course, yeah. No, I, I, I do remember them mentioning Spokane, and I was like, is this supposed to be Washington? You know, it's got a hell of a lot of mountains for Washington, but okay. The, it's uh... also pretty warm during Christmas for Washington, isn't it? Uh, I or is, mean, you or could have... Okay you could up there? Yeah, you could have a year that was that warm. Um, mm. it, it it would be kind of an off year, but you you could you could have it. Th- that uh, that gigantic basketball scene is is preceded by the free willy moment. And I meant to look this up. Do you know if this came before or after free willy? I'm assuming after, right? Oh, I'm really not sure. Because I literally he yells at the dog and is like, "Go away, go away! I don't love you anymore. Go away!" And I was like. Uh, was this like the thing in 90s kids movies it must have been but i th- i thought that was i i could have put that in my what the fuck moments that he i mean though the entire conflict at the beginning was that this dog had been abandoned in in the wild and was starving to death that's why he needed the vanilla pudding in the first place and right. so and then the kid just steals the dog back to to set him free in the wild again and he's like i found you somebody else will find you in these same or no i guess he takes him across the river Right, so he he can't he's not supposed to be able to get back. You know, but of course, Buddy, who is a serial killer. I mean, he is a serial killer. He's going to show up again. You know, he's he's somehow able to make it back. I thought he should have come back because then, of course, you know, uh, everything's looking bleak in the game, and they're they think they're out all their players, all the chips are down, and they're losing. And then Buddy shows up, and it's dramatic and everything. And I really thought he should have come back with, like, a flak jacket and a war helmet <laughs> on with, like, some bullet holes in it, you know? And it, could have, and it should have been like, what the hell happened to you, Buddy? And he's just like... Rrr, 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 rrr. Oh, I've seen some shit. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, I was like, I, I, think, I think this movie could have had, like, a little time travel in it, just not on screen, because why not, right? Yeah, sure. Why did they put the shoes on him? It seems like that would make it harder for him to go around. It on... really seems like it would. Like I, keep... it seems like it would have been hard in real life for the actual dog to move around. So I'm actually pretty impressed. And then in the credits, they said they didn't use any special visual effects for the basketball scenes, which I thought was a little, um, in some cases, tough to believe. Well, I they they use inventive cutting, but right. you know, I mean, they they do that with humans playing basketball. This this dog, yeah. I I. <laughs> I researched this dog. This dog literally was taught to play many different sports. Like, all of these sequels are apparently based on what the real, very dead buddy could do. Like, the owner found him as a stray and just taught him, and the dog was like, yeah, sure, let's play basketball. And he was on David Letterman uh, shooting hoops and and all sorts of other stuff. And this dog was, like, semi-famous before this. He was actually in season six of Full House as... As their dog. Oh, I think I saw that, yeah. So that's what this dog does. I was surprised that the dog did not die of, like, a a, a deviated septum because... <laughs> oh, yeah, it looked like that <laughs> basketball would hurt. Right, yeah. It's like this dog takes about 900 basketballs to the face in this <laughs> yeah. film. So you know there are more on the cutting room floor, plus apparently the dog just loved doing this. Or it was just as bleak as it was in the movie, and, you know, even though there wasn't an angry clown, maybe the dog was still... Yeah, yeah. I see the dog in between shots, like, you know, blood running down its nose, and it's like, I can fucking shoot! I can fucking (laughs) shoot! Don't you fucking tell me! Roll it! Roll it! (laughs) dog was very committed. It was like the last days of Patton or something on that set. I, I was really happy with that last scene, honestly. The the, the or not, I guess not the last, but the the big basketball climax because I was like, you know, through the movie, I, I was like, I was promised a basketball playing dog, and instead I've got this bleak, dismal tale about a child on the verge of suicide, and uh, and then it was like now fifteen minutes straight of a goddamn dog playing basketball. Yeah. I was I was pretty happy about that. I also thought it was I it got the one uh, genuine laugh out of me from the entire movie, which was the uh, coach from the other team who kept saying, "Cover the dog, cover 
the dog <laughs> because nobody would cover the dog and the dog kept scoring. So I was like, I, I thought that was pretty funny. I thought that having the dog play in the actual game, like that was clearly necessary to the plot, but it was also such an obvious gimmick too. Like they, they wouldn't have stood for that, especially like someone would have gotten sued or punched in the face or like there's, there would have been an upset of some kind. Right. Of course. I mean, it's, it's, I, you know, or else they would have like let it happen for like, five minutes or something and then they mm-hmm. would have like laughed and you know been like anyway good game you know but right but no i mean this is you know this is a game about a dog who plays basketball we gotta we gotta willingly suspend our disbelief <laughs> for those 25 minutes of dog playing basketball scene but it was also sort of about teamwork from from a coach who you know lied to his team about who he was he was very into teamwork that was you know and and i also thought did you think that was weird? Because so like, there's a scene like I don't know halfway through the film where the kid uh, goes to make a three point shot and uh, at the very last second and he fails and the coach tells him you know you were doing it for the wrong reasons you gotta just love the game and you gotta love to play and uh, enjoy your teammates teamwork 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 and then the end of the big climax game is there's like five seconds left and he's there where he could make a three point shot. And he looks around, and everybody's covered, but Buddy's open. And I really thought it was going to end with him being him just throwing it to Buddy to have fun, and and Buddy would make the assist and uh, and win the game for them. And instead, he makes the three point shot again, but this time he happens to get it. And I was like, wait, wait, wasn't it about teamwork? Oh yeah, see, I I think that would have fit better. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think the idea was that he saw Buddy, and he was supposed to use Buddy as an example, because remember, the, the coach was like, you you got to, instead of doing it for the wrong reasons, you've got to learn to play basketball like this dog. This dog doesn't care what his point average is. He just loves the game. And so, like, he was using Buddy as an example of playing for exactly the wrong reasons. He was inspired by Buddy. He wasn't... But but still, it, they made a. I I thought they made a weird point of showing how open Buddy was, and uh, because nobody was covering the dog, and, <laughs> and then he just makes the shot. And I but I was like, wait, but you know, the the this isn't a movie where the point is like the power was inside you all along. This is a movie where the point was teamwork and you know just love playing. But I guess seeing Buddy made him remember. Ah, I'm just gonna have fun. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, the kind of twist after you know because because it's like at first everything's bleak and uh we focus on the dead dad who was a fighter pilot wasn't that awesome oh yeah i thought it was interesting that it wasn't like some sort of you know like dad died of a heart attack or in a car accident it was he was a fighter pilot it went down and and that was something i was like that's a detail you put in you don't just put in for no reason like that's very chekhov's gun right you don't put in a dead fighter pilot dad for no reason but nope it was just meh after all of that bleakness is kind of overcome because now he has buddy and he gets to own buddy and he's playing on the basketball team he's not just the water boy being picked on anymore you you knew that some sort of complication had to enter the plot right because there wasn't one there wasn't really a conflict up until right. a certain point in the movie it was just carrying along with the with the dog befriending I, it, it literally felt as if we, we could have just followed the basketball season at that point. It could be a basketball movie, and that's the conflict. Uh, you know, it could have turned into Hoosiers or whatever. But instead, they reintroduced the crazy clown, the, like, unfit clown. And there's that scene where, like, his car is falling apart, and I really was... I don't know, that was another part where I was really kind of genuinely upset, because I was like, this guy's gonna die. And that's going to be on that kid's conscience forever. Oh, yeah. Well, this kid, I mean, what he actually ends up doing to this clown, like, costs him thousands of dollars in damage and, and takes away his dog and, like, makes it so he, I mean, he can barely make a living anymore. Like, it's... Right, I mean, right. I mean, he should have been in that courtroom with, like, a neck brace and in crutches. Right. But I really thought, and I guess this is because I'm stupid and don't understand kids' movies, but I really thought that a rival team was going to try to kill Buddy. <laughs> and I kept waiting for that. I kept waiting for, especially after the head of the basketball bullies gets sent onto another team because oh, they yeah. let him be a star. Well, I thought how crazy the, the dad of that guy was. Because he, he, he 
the kid got kicked off of the team, right? Or something he, happened there, and then the the dad moved them specifically to the other school just so that they could meet off against the other te- kids' team in the finals. The, the kid just gets pulled out of the game because he's he's starting to make uh, uh, bad decisions, and he's just obviously. Tired oh, right, and, and the dad out. takes him away. Right, and I really thought the coach, like, because he was, you know, he was kind of supposed to be the uh, the calming father figure influence, you know, out of this and just be perfect and everything. I really thought he would pull the kid aside and be like, you know, hey, it's cool, you got to go with your dad, I understand. But instead, he's just like, you're dead to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was an interesting twist well, that they... Okay. According to him, the coach was dead to himself anyway, so maybe that's... Right, he's been dead a long time. Yeah. So maybe whole... that's just his method. Like, that's how he copes with things. When, when he doesn't like things to happen, he's just like, okay, they're dead, whatever. <laughs> maybe. Which, and and that whole... I, I guess it's not that scene. It's But but that scene's very disturbing as well. That and an earlier... Do you remember the laundry scene? when when uh josh is still the laundry or the water boy and he's right. doing the team's laundry which is very strange and it's it's literally i believe in freddy krueger's basement uh the, like the steam room where he's doing that and like the guy who be- later becomes the coach is like skulking around in the shadows right and we don't even know what he's doing there because it's never clear what his job is until later when the kid volunteers him to be the basketball coach, despite not knowing his name, so right. I'm not sure how he pulled that one off. And then later, when he goes to try to get the signature in the in the uh, on the baseball card, and he's like, "That man is dead." He like puts it through this like corrugated iron step, as if they're in some sort of like steel foundry. I mean, it felt it felt very like they were gonna shoot a Nine Inch Nails video at any moment. <laughs> both of those scenes, you know, it's I this entire film is just drenched in terror and sadness yeah that that seems right under the surface there (laughs) the um i it's even some of it is even poetic with the only place that the kid can like bring himself to play basketball is this old abandoned churchyard that nobody gives a shit about anymore oh yeah so like he's the only so he has to fix it up and everything and and it's like like the setting itself like the setting itself is actually pretty interesting because that place was actually pretty beautiful in contrast to this to this dark boiler room that has this <laughs> weird vibe in it. You know, I I used to work for a company where we would set up projects for like cleaning up areas and stuff like that. That was that was part of the job. And I'm like, that kid did like uh, at least a nine hundred twelve hundred dollar job on that damn <laughs> basketball court. Like he just finds some abandoned basketball court or some abandoned house that happens to have an overrun disgusting court behind it and is like yeah i'm gonna practice here sure again you know and then the bushes start shaking so (laughs) this very different film that could have been uh that could have come out of that uh but he did an amazing uh job of cleaning that area up oh yeah it looked it looked amazing almost like i i don't know it had been been done by a set crew or something (laughs) almost let's not <laughs> let's not go too far here the d- did you notice when the kid first meets buddy because they have this moment on the road where buddy falls out of the um uh he, he's in a a, a dog carrier and he the... gets accidentally hit by the mom who doesn't see the dog for some reason right right it, well the carrier she almost hits the carrier it's not she doesn't hit buddy uh he's... right but she does hit the carrier knocks it over and that's why he's able to escape right and... Did did you get a very like Oliver Stone's The Doors feeling there? Like oh, when I don't uh, know what that is. I'm sorry. <laughs> when, uh, Val Kilmer as Jim Morrison is very young and like uh, passes by an Indian in the desert uh, on on a highway, and and it's like their spirits touch essentially is kind of what's implied. And... Oh I, yeah, I could definitely see that happening with the dog and the boy there, but he didn't say anything. I I thought it was a little strange. I thought that they were good. That's when they were going to take the dog home and start to like take care of it then and yeah. then that didn't happen until way later right and so that's why it felt like it was a very mystical scene like like their fates were intertwined because it oh, wasn't yes and it... they'd glimpsed each other once before <laughs> right it wasn't like okay now act two starts it was like you know this this ah oh, the machinations of of uh of fate twine us all within it right did, <laughs> speaking of that abandoned house did that kid walk 20 miles to school 
I'm not sure. It's not clear. Because he, he, he walk like they show the the scene where he comes upon the abandoned house, it's like he goes through a forest and then this abandoned area where the house is kind of in the forest or whatever, but the school doesn't seem to be in a forested area. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe that kid's just wandering all around town and it doesn't and no one is really keeping track of him anyway, so Yeah, yeah, maybe. The 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 um uh, and, and those scenes as well, just in general, it is filmed like a horror movie, and I thought that was an odd choice for a kid's movie. Also, did you notice that, that most most of the grown-ups were really boring and dumb? Yeah, but I mean, that's kind of par for the course for kids' movies, isn't it? Is it? I, I don't know. I'm, I, even as a kid, I didn't much watch kids' movies. I uh. found them very strange, and so that's why this is an exciting adventure for me. I mean... Yeah. But I mean, some of the adults, I mean, they were either really disturbing or, or boring, but like the the first coach, I mean, he was he was kind of disturbing. He Yeah, yeah. He like, was interesting he, that way. He and the clown fall, fell on the interesting but disturbing scale. Mm-hmm. You know, I I would expect us to have maybe seen like a bizarre, disturbing fetish scene with him if this weren't so much a kid's movie. <laughs> right. But then like his mom kept being really excited about working at the third largest napkin producer in the country. And it's she, like she was a very exuberant person. All of her phone conversations, even her conversation, I noticed with um, she was talking with the school counselor and they were talking about the kid's dad's death yeah and even during that scene the mom was really chipper about it she's like oh it's been really difficult but we're okay <laughs> right right she was just absolutely willing to open up to anybody about anything and and right. and then there was what was her name mrs pepper who had the daughter and that was weird too how they almost kind of sort of introduced a possible love subplot oh yeah for just a second yeah and then like you see her cheering in the stands later on but nothing really goes anywhere with that. We're, maybe they were like, "We are, we are starting a franchise here, damn it." Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what was going to go on there. I, if maybe, maybe the thing was that the kid was going to be able to choose between the girl and the dog, and he chose the dog. <laughs> did Did you? I, you know, so I know that uh, part of this is the fact that, like, we're we're adults, right? And um. We're uh, uh, we're kind of projecting adult sensibilities onto this film. Of course, of course. But did you think it was an intentional build up to a furry romance? Because you were talking about the, the the dog versus the girl, and there were a few scenes like where the dog's hiding under his bed or where he's hiding under his clothes, and it felt very like sneaking a girl in. I uh, you know I like I didn't get any weird vibes from it in that way, but definitely I mean there is that the whole theme of. The dog is what brings this child to life again. Like this kid has no hope, and like you said, like he's depressed and suicidal until this dog, who was brought to him by fate, like turns everything around and and makes his entire life better and everything. So I mean, in 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 that respect, it's it's sort of I mean, it's got kind of the intensity of a of that sort of connection, I guess. I didn't think it would go super far, but. Like, there's the bath scene, which had the weirdest... That was so bizarre, the way that Splish Splash starts in there. <laughs> and it starts in, like, three seconds too early, so it's very off-putting. And then he's just wallering around with the dog, and the dog doesn't seem to be getting any cleaner. And uh, and I'm like, where where is this scene going? Right, and then it was pointless, because just in the very next scene he gets paint on him everywhere and it's just a disaster i mean that's that's part of the i mean that was a tragedy in itself really yeah <laughs> it was it was it was really basically the same as him getting that horrible cancer that took his leg and his life <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty <Aww>. much <laughs> it's pretty much exactly the same i wonder how many dogs they went through in this franchise oh who knows I wonder if the replacement dog on his wiki page, if he gets his own picture, or if it's like surpassed by Teddy the dog picture oh. here. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. It followed Disney's single parent rule. That's like a thing that you see in a lot of Disney Is movies it? for some reason. Yeah, like like they have this thing against having a two parent family. Huh? You, you you just don't you you don't see that in a lot of movies. It's usually always one parent, and I don't know. It just followed with that pattern 
Interesting. And, and does it usually have like a, um, a, a, a younger child who's ignored halfway through the movie? Or or, or otherwise in distress or orphaned or something. Yeah. I mean, there's usually some sort of horrible tragedy going on. I, You know, the one thing that I thought was, I kind of wondered if, if I was a kid, I, I think I might have liked this movie uh, simply because it's so too. dark, you know, it's so bleak and, and it really kind of presents that the only way to get happier if you're uh, a kid and um, your dad's dead, which my dad died at a young age, and you are uh, uh, you can't make friends very easily and you can't really do what you love, the only way that anything could get better is through magic, and that ain't going to happen. So here I enjoy a movie about it. And, <laughs> and so I think I might have enjoyed it for that reason. As it stands, I mean, you know, it's definitely not the worst movie I've ever watched, but one of the reasons that we picked this is it's available on Netflix. We're trying to do films that are easily available to people out there, but I, I don't think I would recommend it. What what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's it's it was a movie that was okay. I, I didn't think it was particularly poorly done or anything, so... I wouldn't recommend it, but I wouldn't recommend against it either. So yeah, know. yeah. It, it, based on that sterling recommendation, there. If anyone out there wants <laughs> to watch this, let us know what you think. Feel free. Yeah, d I, you know, I would just say, yeah, it's okay to watch, but I wouldn't let the kids watch it. <laughs> it's maybe a little, little too depressing for them, you know. Like, uh, uh, maybe put on some like Cabinet of Dr. Caligari instead for the kids. Oh, that went over my head. I don't know what that is. <laughs> It's, it's it's not necessarily it's just german that's really all you gotta know <laughs> okay <laughs> all right well uh i i think i think that does, about does it for our discussion of air bud uh for now this is michael t bradley this is marisha parker if you have any sort of comments or feedback please write to info at iceonmars.net and tell us what you think bye you have been listening to ice on mars Thank <laughs> you.